In this video, we're going to be discussing the periodic table of elements. We'll talk about where it came from, we'll talk about how it came to be the way it is, and we'll talk about how we can begin using it in a way other than just looking up numbers off of a sheet of paper. Before we get started with the discussion, let's go over a couple quick learning objectives that we're going to cover in this video. First of all, we'll come up with an official definition of what the periodic table is. You guys have probably been using it for a while now, uh, but we haven't really talked a lot about it specifically, and here's our first opportunity. We'll then spend some time talking about the person who came up with our modern periodic table, a fellow by the name of Dmitry Mendeleev, a Russian scientist, probably one of the greatest scientists to come from that country. We'll then follow up with the actual information that we're really focusing on here. We'll talk a little bit about the basic organization of the periodic table, how it was put together, and what are some of the terms we use to describe it. And then we'll give you guys a little bit of a preview of some of the advanced organization that appears in the table. The table is very famous because of all the layers and layers of organization that it has. Uh, and we'll start learning a little bit about what some of those layers are and follow up with it later on in the year. Let's begin our discussion today with a definition of what the periodic table actually is. At its roots, it's simply a tool used to organize the known elements in our universe. In Mendeleev's time, scientists had been working for years to come up with a way of doing it, and it wasn't until he came along that we actually settled on a format for this that scientists agreed was the best way to approach it. Let's talk about how some of those organizational pieces uh, came into play. First off, the elements in the periodic table are most obviously organized in order of increasing atomic number. Now this is interesting because back in the day of Mendeleev, the atomic number hadn't yet been discovered because we hadn't discovered protons. His periodic table was organized by atomic mass, uh, which eventually evolved into a better understanding of atomic number that we use today. The second layer of organization I would say that goes into the periodic table is that it is organized by changes in electron configurations. The reason the periodic table has this peculiar shape to it is because it's not simply a list of elements in order by increasing atomic number. We group them in columns by how electrons are organized and that's what causes the shape of the periodic table to take uh, the form it has. Again, interestingly enough, we had not yet discovered the electron when Mendeleev put his table together, which is yet a little more insight into the genius of his organizational scheme. Lastly, the table is ordered by increasing and decreasing chemical properties, and this is the tool Mendeleev used to really put the table together. He knew that the elements in each one of his columns had similar set of characteristics, and he grouped the columns the way he did as he saw those characteristics change over time. We'll talk a lot more about that a little bit later on in the video, but this is the basic setup of our periodic table, and this is why scientists have agreed on this setup and have agreed on this shape to meet these particular goals. Now aside from the information that puts the periodic table together, most modern periodic tables also include lots of other important information that makes it easier for us to look up certain data. Things like density, states of matter, electron configurations are all things that you can find on your periodic table. And depending on the manufacturer of your periodic table, some data will be there, other data will not. It's your job to know what your periodic table has to offer and how to find that information when necessary. Now before we dive into some of the details of the periodic table, let's talk about its creator a little bit, a fellow by the name of Dmitry Mendeleev, again one of Russia's most famous scientists. Uh, he is the creator of the periodic table, which happened in the year 1871. He himself was born in the year 1834 and lived to the year 1907, in the ripe old age of 72. He was the youngest of at least 14 other brothers and sisters, although the exact number of siblings he had is something that is up for debate. Mendeleev's early life was unfortunately marred by a lot of tragedy, mostly in the form of his parents. Uh, his father died at a young age after being blinded in an accident from the disease tuberculosis. His mother took up the family role to uh, get some work and pay for those 14 brothers and sisters uh, in a glass factory where she was the manager, but the factory itself eventually burned down, leaving the Mendeleev family in poverty. Recognizing the genius in her youngest son, Dmitri, and wanting to see that he had a good life, she packed up the entire family, traveled across the country of Russia for hundreds and hundreds of miles to bring him to St. Petersburg, where he could receive a proper education. Again, a tragedy followed. Uh, shortly after arriving in St. Petersburg to get him there, uh, the mother herself died of tuberculosis, leaving the children, Dmitri included, uh, without parents. <laughs> 
Luckily, though, the move was a great thing for the Dimitri, for the Mendeleev family. Uh, Dmitri Mendeleev eventually became a school teacher and principal, later moving on to be a professor at St. Petersburg University, where he not only wrote some of the first textbooks in chemistry ever, uh, ever but also became a very prominent scientist in the worldwide community through the discoveries and thinking that he was able to publish. He was recognized for these discoveries and by the Royal Swedish Academy, where he was a member. He received the Davy Medal, the Copley Medal, and he was even elected a foreign member of the Royal Society, a very high prestige for a, any scientist in the world. You might notice he never received a Nobel Prize. He was actually asked or picked to receive a Nobel Prize in the year 1906, uh, but due to internal politics in the Nobel Committee, he was snubbed for that prize, which was given to someone else. Despite some internal politics uh, that might have prevented him from receiving that highest honor, he is again still recognized as the greatest scientist to come out of the country of Russia, and in my opinion, one of the greatest chemical minds that we will talk about throughout the entire year. His creation of the periodic table is still in use today, hundreds of years later, despite the dramatic increases of knowledge of chemistry that we have. It is still the foundation of all the work that we do. So let's take a look at the periodic table that Mendeleev first created. This image to the left of the slide here is the copy of what that first image is. Uh, it doesn't look a lot like our periodic table today, but when you start breaking it down a little bit, you'll see there's a lot of commonalities. Uh, first of all, you can see that there are columns of elements and rows of elements, and he was able to group elements uh, by similar characteristics. We can see here We've got a group with the element nitrogen, and we have a group over here starting with the element fluorine. And if you compare this to your periodic table, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, and antimony are all in a column, whereas fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all in a column as well. So while this might look a lot different than our periodic table, it has a lot of things in common with what, Mendele with what we use today. Now, interestingly enough, Mendeleev was not the only scientist working on this. There are other scientists out there that created similar periodic tables at the same exact time. Uh, and he, like many of these other scientists, placed elements in order of increasing atomic mass and tried grouping elements by common properties. Again, nitrogen and phosphorus and arsenic were put in the same group because all of them have similar chemistry. And that's how we were trying to organize elements. Mendeleev's periodic table stood out from the others because of its ability to predict missing elements. At the time of its discovery, there were only 56 elements known, uh, despite the 120 that we're working on these days. He was able to show that certain elements should be present that had not yet been discovered, and he left those on his periodic table as question marks. Turns out, he came up with the terms to name those elements calling them, at the time at least, eka aluminum because it's the element one below aluminum, and eka silicon because it's the one below the element silicon. He basically said, I don't know what these elements are, but based on the way I've organized my periodic table, there should be an element here, and I don't know what it necessarily is. And it turns out, within a decade or two of him creating this periodic table, both of these elements were later discovered. Eka aluminum is now known as the element gallium, an interesting metal that melts at room temperature, even in the palm of your hand. And eka silicon is now known as the element germanium, an element very commonly used in creating integrated circuits because it acts as a semi-metal. Both of these elements not only fell in the periodic table where Mendeleev said they would, but he was actually able to predict most of their properties and characteristics, and in all cases matched very closely to what the actual elements had. Again, further evidence that what Mendeleev put together was a very monumental discovery and a very important advancement in our understanding of chemistry. All right, so that wraps up the lead-in of what the periodic table is. Let's focus on some of the structure of the periodic table. We're going to start with some of these organizational techniques in this particular video and move on to talking about some of the more advanced organization a little bit later on down the road. At first glance, the periodic table is organized into two big groups of things. We start off by having rows on the periodic table going from left to right, and there are seven of those rows right now. Uh, and these rows have a name. They are known as periods. So this is the first period of the periodic table, the second period, the third, etc., etc. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time throughout the year talking about periods, but the one thing that all periods and the periodic table do have in common uh, is that they are filling in electrons, 
in the same ring in the Bohr model. So when you're looking at period four on the periodic table over here, every single one of these atoms are going to place electrons in the same exact ring, which is going to be the fourth ring of the Bohr model. As soon as we get to the end of the row, we start a new ring, uh, which would be electrons in the fifth ring, and that would follow the same pattern. So that is our first term we need to be aware of with our periodic table is that the rows are known as periods. Going up and down on the periodic table, we have our columns. And these columns are known as either families or they're known as groups. And you'll find in class, I tend to use the second term as opposed to the first, but both of them are used. So these are families or groups. Uh, and these are the ones we'll be talking about a whole lot more throughout the year because there's a lot more chemistry to discuss with these. Uh, families and groups are elements that all have similar properties and electron configurations in the last ring. So for example, all the elements in this last column here, known as the noble gases, all have similar characteristics. They're all gases at room temperature, they're all clear, they're all colorless, they're all odorless, and they were placed together like that because of those similar characteristics. So we have rows, which we now refer to as our periods. We have columns, which we now refer to as our family groups. Uh, and that's some terminology we're going to be using throughout the year. Before we wrap up today, we're going to do a little bit of a preview of some of the more advanced organization that exists on the periodic table. Now, we'll be discussing this much more towards the end of the unit, but for now, I want to at least give you a sneak peek as to why we really get excited about this organizational scheme and the layers of organization that really exist. Uh, the advanced organization on the periodic table we're going to refer to a lot in the term of trends. And what trends are are basically uh, regular patterns in chemical properties that are seen as we move on the periodic table. So they're properties that change in ways that match the shape of the periodic table itself. And we'll expect to see property trends as we go up and down the periodic table. And we'll also expect to see properties and trends as we go across the periodic table. Now there's a lot of trends we're going to be talking about this year, but we can give one here as a very quick example. And we can talk about density. It turns out that density on the periodic table starts out on the left very low. Towards the middle of the periodic table, we get very high densities. And when we get to the right side of the periodic table, we get very low densities again. And this happens as we move from left to right for every single row on the periodic table. And it's important to note that this isn't a coincidence. This pattern exists because of the way the table was put together and the genius that Mendeleev put into it with this particular organizational scheme. We'll identify this pattern, this trend, and we'll identify a whole bunch more using a lot of graphing uh, to create graphs to show what those patterns actually are. But again, we'll save that conversation for a little later in the unit. And that brings us to the end of our video for today. Uh, a very simple topic, just introducing what the periodic table is, probably a little more officially than it's been introduced before. Uh, at this point in time, you should be able to do a couple things. Uh, first of all, you should be able to describe what the periodic table is and what we use it for. Uh, you should be able to identify very briefly why Mendeleev's periodic table was superior to others, what he was able to put together that other people had missed. And last but not least, you should be able to identify some key parts about how the table is organized. You should know what families are, you should know what uh, periods are, and last but not least, you should at least have an idea that there are lots of trends and patterns that occur in the periodic table that we have not yet had a chance to talk about. As always, if there are any questions or concerns on anything you've seen here today, please make sure you write those down, bring them to class, and we'll have a discussion uh, and hopefully clear the air and learn a little bit more about how this periodic table works and what we can use it for in class.